We've been watching the second day of questioning of Amy Coney Barrett, the nominee that President Trump has put forward to be the next Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Um, we are going to continue monitoring that hearing. We'll bring you some more, but we do want to give you a little bit of taste of what the five is thinking. Um, we have everybody here today. Kennedy, Juan, Jesse, and Greg Gutfeld is here. Um, you know, I, I do want to just jump in right here, Greg, and play a little sound from earlier from Senator Klobuchar of Minnesota. Klobuchar. Klobuchar. If we could do maybe, you know, I just felt like it was pretty aggressive. Mm. Okay? And that's just fine. And yeah. I think that Judge Barrett handled it, it, handled it well. Let's play slot number three and get Greg's thoughts overall and on this particular sound. Did you have then a general understanding that one of the president's campaign promises was to repeal the Affordable Care Act when you were nominated? Um, I, as I said before, I'm aware that the president opposes the Affordable Care Act. Well, I know you're aware now, but were you aware back then? Well, it seems When you were nominated. Well, Senator Klobuchar, I think that the Republicans have kind of made that clear. It's just been part of the public discourse. Okay, but it just it's within the, is the answer yes then that you well, were. Well, Senator aware of Klobuchar, it? all these questions you're you're suggesting that I have animus or that I cut a deal with the president, and I was very clear yesterday that that isn't what happened. All right, Greg, thoughts? Well, I, I mean, the one thing that I I don't like about these hearings in general is that you learn about a person in the, in how they wield their power when they have it. Like, if they have this authority to treat you like crap, and they do, then they're a terrible person. But if you have the authority to, to, to hammer somebody, but you do it with some kind of grace, that's different. And it seems to me, watching uh, Klobuchar and watching Kamala Harris, these are people that, they just come off smaller. And they come off petty. They're like mean girls. And they're just jealous because this person happens to be smarter and more successful than they are. That's the, that's the impression I get when I, when I watch this. Um, I think so far, my impression is that this, this, this is one tough cookie. And I, I ha I, I'm, I'm assuming like, which this to her is like a day off. <laughs> like, you know, she's got seven kids and, you know, it's like, you know what, I think for fun, I'll go stick around in a Senate hearing and let these bozos bother me. She's not above the law, but she's definitely above the fray. Mm. And when, when it comes to watching her kind of like, in, she's so relaxed. I didn't like the fact that when she was asked about puppies, she deflected to chinchillas. <laughs> Answer the damn question. It's about puppies, not chinchillas. But lastly, I want to say, I think she's, she's got the perfect, you guys are so silly face when she's looking while people are talking, you can just see it on her face. And that, that it, it is pretty impressive. She's playing chess and they're playing kerplunk. <laughs> but my last point is, as a viewer watching this, I always feel like I'm in line at TSA. And you're watching that performative theater of the TSA agents like searching forever for a little, on a little old lady in a wheelchair. You know she's getting through. You know she's no threat, but she's gonna get through, but they have to do this performative karaoke and everybody in line has to sit and watch it. That's what this is. We know she's gonna get in. She's doing a great job. They're not, gonna get, they're not gonna get her on anything, but yet we have to do it. Having said that, I have been wrong about people not wanting to watch this because the ratings are insane. And I thought that no one would be interested, so I was I, wrong. I do think she's just so compelling that people really wanted to watch it. Can I play for you slot number six, Jesse? This is the one where um, Senator Durbin is pressing her on whether the president has the right to delay an election. Does the Constitution give the president of the United States the authority, listen closely to what she asked you, to unilaterally delay a general election under any circumstances. You didn't want to give off-the-cuff answers like a pundit, but rather approach matters with an open mind. I've given that response to every hypothetical that I've been asked in the hearings. And as I said yesterday, I do that regardless whether it's easy or hard. I don't do that to try to, whether the question I mean would be easy or hard. I don't try to do that to signal it, but I do that because it would be inappropriate for me to make a comment. And I don't think I've answered any legal hypotheticals in keeping with the Justice Ginsburg rule. 
I mean, she's just steady. She answers like just a steady hitter. She should have pulled the Ginsburg <laughs> rule when she was asked about puppies. <laughs> I would have loved that. Hey, I don't want to comment about puppies that might come before the court. I, I hate to agree with Juan, but I have to. He made an excellent point the other day. I think it's for the last 30 years now, these nominees come up, and they're not going to say anything about past cases. They're not going to say anything about future litigation. And that's what the liberal justices have done. That's what all the justices have done. So to watch these senators that don't have the sharp of an intellect try to pin this woman down, mm -hmm. who's brilliant, on these cases, it, it, it's, it's almost like sport, watching her deflect some of these senators the way they have. And some of these senators, we, we talked about who yesterday. We don't want to go name names again. But you can tell the people that have lost their fastball. And you can tell others like, like a Durbin or a Blumenthal or a Coons who are a little bit sharper with their questioning. But she's going to sail through. No one's laid a glove on her. And according to the latest Monmouth poll, a large portion of the country now, mm -hmm. plurality, want her confirmed. So if she was asked, I think, uh, about Obamacare, do we have the Jenga soundbite, Dana? I will that was a check. great line by her. As someone that plays Jenga with my it. daughters, this is a perfect answer for how she would handle Obamacare. If we don't have it, the basic answer is the mandate may be able to come out, but it doesn't mean the entire Jenga castle falls down. But you and know what? That's actually kind of a conservative uh, judicial philosophy because it's judicial restraint. You let right. the legislators legislate and you don't overreach. And I think a lot of people felt good about that on, I think, both sides of the aisle because right now it does look like Obamacare is such a disaster that they're going to have to go back and fix it. Ted Cruz said it's raised premiums for the average family $7,000, and insurance companies are getting paid hundreds and millions of dollars in subsidies. And it is ironic that some of these senators ran for president in the primary promising to eradicate Obamacare. They want to get rid of it, and they want Medicare for all. And now they're begging Amy Coney Barrett to keep it there. But it doesn't make a lot of sense. Can I say something that also what you'll see is she'll get on the court. Um, right now, the Democrats really want this issue of severability not to be included, right? The Jenga example was a very good one because it, of what you just said in terms of judicial restraint. But the Democrats want you to believe right. that the whole thing is going to fall. They want the fear. If she was gonna, but, but, plunk. but then, after the election, when she's on the court, if she says that the opposite, then that's what they're going to want. So they want one thing here for politics, but they would rather have the opposite right. in reality. Um, Kamala Harris, uh, the former, uh, not former, excuse me, senator, she's now running for vice president. She's in the building, um, but she didn't come to the hearing room because she was protesting Kennedy the way that the hearing was being conducted in terms of COVID protocols. But how do you think she did in, in this questioning today? I don't think that she has come off particularly well against Amy Coney Barrett. And she has the kind of background, the prosecutorial background, yeah, and true. especially as an attorney general, that she should be able to use more tools at her disposal and do a better job of appealing to the base and independent voters and people who might have an issue with the timing of this nomination. And instead, I think she has come off like she has during her lower points during the debate. And to Jesse's point, uh, she was one of those people who was using the ACA shtick, which you can see right through. You know exactly what each one of these senators are doing uh, with, you know, this fallacious anecdotal evidence trying to show the worst case scenarios from their state. She was the one who not only signed on as a co-sponsor for Medicare for All, she also proposed her own socialized health care system when she was running for president that, as we've talked about, is one of the great undoings of her campaign. And she also talked about uh, completely demolishing private health insurance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here she is appealing to save the ACA as though ACB is going to be the one uh, to bring a sledgehammer to the law single-handedly. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, she could, she could do the same sort of professorial job of taking apart her arguments and, and twisting her words around in a way that Judge Barrett would have to answer. And, and I don't think she's done that effectively. Juan, is there anything that has not come up in these hearings that you wish had? Is there something that she hasn't answered that you think would have been useful to, for Americans to hear? Mass surveillance. Well, I mean, I, you know, I it's just, so I'm repeating myself. Jesse picked up on this, that I think it's both Democrats and Republican nominees 
basically don't answer questions. But the Democrats in this iteration have tried to say, wait a second, hold on. There are people who have answered questions. And today, in specific, what you saw was they said, listen, in the Griswold case, which has to do with contraception, Chief Justice Roberts said that case was properly decided. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, for people who don't know, that case has lots to do with privacy rights that mm -hmm. then extend into issues like Roe v. Wade. Yep. So she says, oh, you know what, I, I can't answer that. And so what you get is senators like Blumenthal, but also Coons and others saying, well, wait a second, other justices now sitting on the court did in fact respond to us that this case was properly decided. She wouldn't do it. And I thought that was disappointing. I wish that she would at least say, yeah, of course that's properly decided. The only cases that she says were properly decided go back to the right of Marbury, the right of a court to interpret the Constitution, and secondly, Brown v. Board of Education with regard to uh, school segregation to, and I mean, loving yes, in terms that of extends super from that. Uh, but, you know, to me, the, the big point here is, look, we're playing a game in which we know that if you look at Justice Thomas, Justice Scalia, Justice Alito, that every time an Obama type of legislation or law came before them, they said no. They're just like red team, blue team, no. And the Republicans are rushing this through because they know she'll be a fourth vote. And when we think about something like the Affordable Care Act, we know that, in fact, President Trump has said he wants it undone. He has offered no replacement. And he thinks that she's going to be another vote to absolutely undo the Affordable Care Act. Can we play Care a little Act. bit of sound from that? So, she, Greg, this is um, her talking about the Affordable Care Act and her position. I have certainly no agenda. I'm not on a mission. I'm not hostile to the ACA at all. And if I were on the court and if a case involving the ACA came before me, I would approach it with an open mind, just like I do every case, and go through the process that we've just discussed. Can you, I mean, I don't know if you can ask for more than that. Also, I mean, I reject the idea that because you don't like something, that makes you hostile to it. We are actually accepting the language and the rhetoric of the left, that somehow that we've introduced this monstrosity of a social program and we're all supposed to say, yeah, it's here with us for life. No, we know there are problems with it. That doesn't make us hostile. That just makes us, you know, human beings with brains. The bigger thing that I have about this whole process is that you have a lot of liberal left-wing women are using things like this in abortion to portray this wildly successful female as somehow a slave to patriarchy, comparing her to the handmaid's tale, dressing up like the handmaid's tale. She's super religious, so she must be, you know, she must be subservient to men. Meanwhile, they, Hironi, or whatever her name is, I can't remember, Hirono? Hirono? Accuses her if she's, uh, asks her if she ever committed sexual assault. Right? I, th I think I mean, it's something that Hirono asks every single night. That's the, yeah, we, I get it. I understand. Is, but if you are making the case that sh that you know men persecute women and, and, and you have to make this case in the in the interest of equality, to ask that woman that question in the interest of equality is purely absurd. Yeah. It's absolutely yeah. absurd. You have her family sitting there. I don't know if they were there at that time, yeah, but they were there. there before. To ask that question in the interest of quote equality is a farce. And so the irony of of, of her being uh, saying that she's subservient to men. She's, in fact, being treated worse by women than by men. I don't think anybody brings up the fact that she's a woman with all these kids. I mean, we have people on the court who have families and children, but I think conservatives bring I've, this I've up like it. saying, oh, oh she's, seen, a, she, she's just a woman. Have you seen some of the stuff on, on Twitter from feminists? Ideal. Feminists no, are not. all over. Directed, I, look, no, no, directed think, toward her saying she cannot be a good mother well, if she's working full well, time. Well, I think that's absurd. Absolutely. Of course, I, th I think from all it's indications, disgusting. she's a great mother, but I just don't think it's really relevant to what we're doing here, which is we're confirming someone to a lifetime position on the court. This woman says, no one's above the law, Kennedy. No one's above the law, so they say, if you're the, the, the member of the Democratic member of the committee, you say, well, OK, what about President Trump pardoning himself? And then she says, well, I can't speak to that because it's it hasn't been litigated. You think to yourself, wait a second, didn't you just say no one's above the law? That includes the president in our democracy. And yet she plays a game in which she says, oh, I can't speak to it. I that, mean, at I that point, you get frustrated. Same. I want to play one additional piece of sound. Uh, this is thought number two, um, because I do think that, especially if you're a young woman, uh, any girls watching here tonight, here is her talking about herself, how she sees herself. Take a listen. I hope that 
you aren't suggesting that I don't have my own mind or that I, I couldn't think independently or that I would just decide, like, oh, let me see what Justice Scalia has said about this in the past, because I assure you I have my own mind. Um, but it, everything that he said um, is not necessarily what I would agree with or what I would do if I were Justice Barrett. That was Justice Scalia. So I share his philosophy, but I have never said that I would always reach the same outcome as he did. Jesse, last word? Well, it's just quite insulting for several Democrat senators to constantly say, oh, well, you must agree with Scalia. And, like, she's not an independent thinker, an independent woman. I think she handled it brilliantly. And to Juan's point, she's being put here because Trump won the election. And she's not there to knock down Democratic legislation. She's there to interpret the law as written in the Constitution. And that's what the Democrats are afraid of. Because this was mentioned, they analyzed how she ruled in four, Fourth Amendment issues, sur illegal search and seizure. And she came down equally on the side of the defendant on the side of the government. She didn't try to broaden the scope of the Fourth Amendment. She didn't try to narrow it. And that's what originalists do. They interpret the law as written. And I think that should give everybody a really strong feeling about how she'll rule going forward. All right. Uh, 